Welcome to the March edition of the Hornet Spotlight. Uh, we are really excited. It's kind of sometimes it's looked at as a kind of a slow time of the year, and I guess maybe so since it's getting close to spring break time. But uh, we want to congratulate all the winter athletes as their season uh, seasons have wound down. Uh, Ethan Smiley qualified for the state finals in wrestling again for the third consecutive year. Congratulations to him and Coach Irwin and the wrestlers. They just finished up this past weekend. Uh, the girls basketball team finished a fine 15 and six season uh, under Coach Raker. So we're very happy the, the boys swim team finished 12 and two. Uh, some of their best times of the year were had in the sectional, just a super competitive sectional in Marion County. And uh, all that's left standing are the boys basketball team. They will be involved in their sectional tournament uh, starting next week, first week in March. And uh, we look forward to that. It should be an extremely competitive tournament, one of the best in the state. And hopefully the Hornets will come out on top. Uh, we play our first ball game on Wednesday, March 1st against Indian Creek. So it should be a great game. And, and we look forward to everybody coming over to Danville and watching those guys play. They've had a great year. Uh, as we speak, they're 15 and six. So good year for basketball here at Beach Grove. Also, uh, the play was just tremendous. The Crucible, just an incredible uh, job of direction by Mr. Bush again. Uh, every time you think they can't do any better, they, they do. Uh, it was an amazing performance, powerful performance by a lot of our kids. Uh, it's amazing to watch our students do that kind of performing. It, it's very special. Uh, Mr. Dean had a lot of uh, state qualifiers in solo and ensemble, as did Mr. Wynn. Uh, we just a ton of things going on in March as well. Besides fine arts, athletics, we've got academic competition kicks into high gear. Uh, the ICC competition will be the first week in March. Uh, we do have this year is big time test year for all our sophomores. Uh, the first week in March, we will be doing I-STEP. It is a new test for graduation requirements. So if you're the parent of a sophomore, make sure they get in early on the 28th and on the 1st uh, because they will be testing bright and early on the mornings of the 1st and 2nd of March. Very important test. It's a test they must pass in order to earn their graduation requirement. So we, uh, we're very confident that most of our students will do very well on this. And uh, with, with some help at home, uh, we're confident we'll do well there too. It's, uh, there, are, there are many activities coming up in March. Probably I would be remiss in not saying the number one activity coming up in March is spring break. Uh, that will be beginning um, the last day. Uh, well, actually, the first day of spring break is March 18th, and we come back to school on April 3rd. So having said all that, calendar updates. Again, check the Beach Grove City School website for any information. Specifically, click on the high school for uh, stuff about what's going on here. We do have our alumnus of the month selected by the Renaissance Committee for March, and he is from the class of 1996. He is our second member of that class to be selected, and we're very happy to have Jason Hammer with us today. Thank Congratulations, you. Congratulations, Jason. Thank you. Uh, it's awesome to be back. It's been a little while since I've been through these halls, but it looks great. It smells fantastic. <laughs> it's everything that I thought it would be coming back. This is great. Thank you. Uh, Jason is a class, like I mentioned, 1996, so he's, it's been a while since he's been gone. Let's reminisce a little bit. <laughs> That's a nice way of calling me old. Thank you. I appreciate a, a that. A throwback here, a little <laughs> bit about what were some of the highlights in the early mid-90s at Beach Grove? What were some of the activities, some of the personalities, uh, some of the things going on that you rem everybody remembers certain things about high school? Right. Tell us a little bit about yours. I had a great time in high school. I tried to stay active, uh, played different sports. I was a class president for two years, my junior and senior year here at Beach Grove. And ultimately, it was a good group of people. There, there wasn't much drama. It wasn't like it is today. Nobody's protesting. Nobody's, you know, trying to do, save the world or whatever. It was a group of kids that came to school, had fun, had fun being around each other. Uh, we had great camaraderie in our class. We bonded really closely. And um, I had a good time in school. When I look back, at my time in high school here at Beach Grove, I had a great time. I enjoyed coming to school every day. And um, you were involved in what activity? You said you were class yeah, officer, anything else? Class officer, uh, played some basketball, played some baseball, played some football, uh, did a lot here at the communications area. 
um, love to work on video and audio projects, and um, that's kind of where I kind of got my passion for broadcasting. I knew I always kind of wanted to get into mm -hmm. it as a kid because I'd screw around on microphones and stuff like mm -hmm. that, but uh, coming here, I was able to really kind of grasp that you can do this for a career, and it kind of gave me that boost I needed to take it to the next level. Who was running telecom back in those days? It was a, a group of different people. It seemed like we had some changes going on. Dale Thomas was the person mm -hmm. that was kind of uh, influential in setting a lot of things up here. And then when he left, Sarah Norman came in, and uh, she ran the communications department for a year or two. Uh, but both of those folks were phenomenal and uh, very encouraging, and they helped us out. They helped us get freelance work sometimes, because this was a state-of-the-art studio by high school standards back in the mid-'90s. But it's really good right now. But uh, this equipment was all new around 1994, 1995. Mm -hmm. So a lot of local businesses would come here to Beach Grove, and we would freelance their video commercials, their project shoots, anything they needed telecommunications-wise. And uh, both Dale and Sarah were very um, influential in helping us get that rolling, get some work, and get some real experience. So you spent a lot of time in this room. I did. I did. When I wasn't screwing around on a sports field or uh, being stuck in pass room or detention, um, absolutely. <laughs> I had a lot of time in here. And you developed a real, you, you had the passion before you can, it seems to me like. Yeah, I remember you, as a kid. You had the interest and it kind of fueled the passion. Sure. Um, when I was a kid growing up, I'm 39 years old right now, so the toys that were around when I were little, uh, we're like the He-Man, Masters of the Universe kind of stuff. Uh, you can Google that and YouTube it if you have no idea what I'm talking about. But He-Man came with this really cool castle that had a microphone in it. And instead of playing the way you're supposed to in it, I would do the weekly top 40 in it because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and I enjoyed doing that. And like growing up, I would always look at the news and people on television and think, that looks really fun. And I grew up in an era where, you know, Johnny Carson did the late night show and then David Letterman. Letterman had the late, late show at that point. It came on at 1235. Mm -hmm. I would sneak in my bed and wake up at 1230, turn on the old beat up black and white TV because that's how old I am. And I would watch Letterman and just laugh by myself. And then later in life finding out, wait a minute, this is a guy from Indiana. This is a guy that did this growing up. He went to Ball State University. That's what I want to do. I fell in love with broadcasting because of David Letterman. And then going through school, that's kind of the, uh, the goal that I thought I wanted to do. And you went to his alma mater, right, from yeah. here? Yep, went to Ball State University up in Muncie. Um, my first year there, that fall of 1996, going into 1997, I uh, did a lot of work on the TV station there, WCRD. And they also had a radio station of the uh, same call letters. And I was doing both at the same time and really fell in love with the radio side. Um, now, in retrospect, was that a good decision? No, but TV makes a little bit more money, but that's okay. Um, but no, I fell in love with radio. It became my passion because you can put your personality into radio. Nothing against TV. TV is a great industry. Uh, you can make a lot of money. People see you. That's awesome. But sometimes you want to put your personality into your product, and that's why I got into radio. Um, Radio is something that you, it's all you. When it's you behind a board, turning on a microphone, whether you're talking up a song, telling a story, or doing a political or sports talk show, um, it's all you. And you're painting that visual picture for the listener. Sometimes on news, people know the story already. They're just curious to see how you deliver it. Radio is different. People want to be entertained and informed. And informed. And the entertainment section kind of is what got my juices flowing. And you were at Ball State. You mentioned before we came on air here that you stayed a couple years at Ball State and felt like it was time to go. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to get a uh, radio job after my sophomore year at Ball State. Uh, so I had to make that decision of do I want to continue paying $40,000 a year for two more years in hopes to get a radio job or go take a professional radio job. So to me, it was a no-brainer. Um, I always thought I could always go back in time and get my degree. And I've taken some classes since then. I think I'm still going to graduate eventually. Uh, but no, I took a job in Indianapolis at a station that's no longer around the way that it was when I came to Indianapolis. It was a station at 93.9. It was a country channel called The Bear. Uh, now it's kind of the classic old school hip hop channel. And radio stations 
if you don't know, sometimes they change their format quite frequently. Uh, very few stations stay the way they are for long periods of time. Uh, WZPL has, WIBC has. I've been fortunate enough to work at both of those, working at WIBC now. But 93.9, when I came to Indianapolis, was a country channel called The Bear. And they made you have these ridiculously lame bear nicknames as a DJ. There was like the Ranger and there was Deb Honeycutt. Luckily, my last name actually is Hammer. And it sounds like a cheesy over the top radio name, so they just let me keep it. And I didn't have to get one of those annoying bear names. <laughs> so, and your first job was as a on air DJ. DJ? Yep, did the late night shift, which if you've never worked third shift, um, it's an interesting shift, especially on the radio because I like to do a lot of interactive bits where people call in and tell us their thoughts on things. You learn quickly that during a third shift, the only people you speak with are people that are either up to no good or want to tell you how bad you stink. And those were fun times though, because you kind of get your feet wet and you learn things and you learn about the audience and maybe they were right at the same time. And you time. develop a little bit of a thick skin maybe. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Although I will say it's harder now than it was when I started because of social media. There was no Twitter, there was no Instagram, Snapchat when I was first getting into radio. Now, uh, when I do a show on WIBC, if somebody disagrees, I've got 55 people going to Twitter and calling me an idiot right away. It's fun, we make it part of the show, I don't care. Uh, but if you don't have a thick skin, you're absolutely right. Broadcasting is not for you. Is the, is the some of the kids we have who are out there at various schools and they're trying to make their way, mm -hmm. uh, this program's been phenomenal in terms of getting kids interested and, and, and doing some different things. And some of them have come back and said, it's all about your Twitter count. It's all about how many hits you're getting. Right. How much truth is there to that? It depends on what your job title is and what's expected. Radio now has changed to where it's almost like TV. You're doing videos, you're being seen. People want to see what you're doing. You're doing Facebook Live. You're doing Snapchats during events. You're live tweeting award shows and Colts games and things like that. It's full service media. It's multimedia journalism now. It's not just one specific thing. If you only focus on one specific thing now, you won't be employed for very long. Um, so some folks, they beat their chest up over how many followers they have. Right. If they do that, then they've done one of two things. They have a great product or they've paid for it. <laughs> Sometimes both. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a whole new ball game. And if you can't adjust and go with the changes, then the game will pass you by. And I've been fortunate enough in my career um, since I was 19, 20 years old doing this. I'm 39 now. Uh, I've been able to see a lot of changes and adapt to them. And it's what you had to do to survive. Now, would you say the, uh, uh, all this social media and all the Facebook and all the, the, the Twitter accounts and, and all the likes and dislikes and all those things, has that kind of taken the place of ratings, the old-fashioned Nielsen ratings that we, used, that we grew up right. with? Right. Um, yes and no. Uh, you can judge the success of your show by the interaction you're getting from social media. But at the end of the day, uh, it's all about money. And the reason you want to have good ratings is so that your sales so, staff can go out and get you those endorsements and make money for the radio station and keep the lights on and pay the bills. And still, people will buy into a radio station based on the numbers, based on the ratings. So you can kind of get street cred uh, with a lot of social media action, but street cred sometimes doesn't pay the bills. Okay, so it, it's, it's a little both, I guess, is what yeah, I'm hearing you say. Yeah, it's definitely both. And a lot of radio stations now, and especially MS Communications, where I work downtown, they have a whole separate um, digital department where that's their whole special specialty. They're designed to make money digitally off of the show that you're doing. So if they can sell a video of your best of segments, if they can sell a blog that you write each week, if they can sell your social media post tagged by a client, that's a whole different area of revenue that radio stations can capitalize on now. Uh, you've, you've obviously been in the radio business, what now, 20 years then? Yeah. I yeah. mean, professionally. Yeah. Taking money to do what you enjoy, <laughs> right. which is probably the secret to a lot of success, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And, you know, we were kind of joking before we uh, started this interview off the air. Uh, when people ask me, you know, what advice do you have for people coming up in broadcasting? I jokingly tell them, get into TV. If you're into TV, great, go for it. Um, that's where the money is. 
You'll make more money as a whole in television. But for me, it never was about the money. Now, don't get me wrong. I've been able to be okay. I've had the highest rated shows on my station. I'm all right. But uh, it's never been about that. It's about waking up every day and loving what you do. I would rather make $10,000 less a year going to a job that I love, that I can mold into my own, that I enjoy doing, than going somewhere and being miserable or being told what to do every single minute of the day or being micromanaged every single minute of the day. And it's all about what you're into, what your motivation is. If money is your motivation, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, capitalism. I'm a big capitalist. <laughs> Capitalism's good. Uh, but I've never been somebody that thinks, man, if I don't make this many dollars, I'm not a success. No, I like to make people laugh. I like to entertain people. And if I can make a comfortable living doing that, then I'm happy. Um, you, you just mentioned, again, before we came on air, you talked about the, the last thing I looked at. You, you had a Sunday show. Now you're going five days a week. Yeah, we got the big uh, Monday through Friday show on 93 WIBC News Talk. Um, backtrack just a little bit. I did talk radio for a little bit at one of my previous pit stops. Uh, I worked at WZPL for 10 years. I was there when Dave Smiley first got there and launched the Smiley Morning Show. And I was kind of the stunt boy that would go out and do all the ridiculous things and humiliate himself because look at me. Um, but eventually I got tired of... Uh, talking up Britney Spears records. And I don't know how much Britney Spears you listen to, Mr. Clevenger, but it's awful. Uh, <laughs> so I decided that I want to get into something a little bit more uh, in depth. So I kind of get into sports talk, got into news talk, and that's one of the genres of radio that will never change. People will always complain about politics. People will always talk about sports. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're going to the barber shop, if you're at your family's dinner table for Thanksgiving, usually one of those two topics is the big topic of conversation. That's true. Um, so that's why I am just thrilled to be at WIBC. Uh, the show that I do, the Hammer and Nigel show, Monday through Friday, 9 to 11. And then on Sunday, we have a best of show that airs 1 to 3 p.m. Um, I, I love the way that we can go down different avenues of conversation. Sure, we're going to talk about the stories of the day. Some of it's serious. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. But other times, it can be fun. And I'm a guy that loves living in Indianapolis. I've lived here basically my whole life. Um, I love Indiana. And it's a show about Indiana and living here and what people are talking about. And if you can make a few people laugh, it's a good day. And it's not hard to figure out what they're talking about right now since January. Yeah, well, for a lot longer than that. A lot longer <laughs> well, than that. That's true, too. Um, I know uh, from looking at your website that you have a... Uh, I, I guess I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I looked at your website and I saw pictures of your sons, and I go, man, that place looks familiar, and it was our gym. <laughs> yeah. So you have a couple young men who are going to school in the Beach Grove City Schools and, and uh, some family that are providing some services for our kids. Tell us a little bit about your family and, and why you're here and you know, why you're at Beach Grove and what makes Beach Grove the place where you want your family to be. Sure. Um, I've got a lot of family all over the city. Uh, the Geralds are relation to the Hammers. So uh, from Amy Geralds to Katie to TJ to Kurt and everybody and in between, uh, if there's a Geralds that's gone through here, it's related to me in some direction. Um, also, my wife is the uh, librarian over the middle school right now. So for those who have ever gotten in trouble and had to go to the library and there was this lady there that was incredibly mean, that's my better half. Um, also, my kids, uh, they're 12 and 9. Um, my oldest is in his final year over at South Grove right now. My young one, 9-year-old, he's over at Central in his last year right now. Uh, they'll be changing schools next year, moving up one grade. Uh, they're both involved in sports. They do a lot of baseball, a lot of basketball. They stay active. Um, keeping the kids active is a big deal for us. We don't want them to be those kids that sit around and just play on their phones and text their friends and play video games and get all fat and out of shape and all that kind of stuff. Um, I know it seems somewhat ironic that a fat guy is telling his kids <laughs> he doesn't want them to be fat guys. But no, we want them to be active and stay involved in things. And um, it's a fun community here. And this is kind of where I grew up. And I, uh, some people will argue this, but became an adult. So <laughs> this is a, a good place. And I like to see my kids going through those same things that I went through. And this is a good place to do that. It really is. Um, 
you've been in the business for more or less 20 years, probably sounds like your whole life, but mm -hmm. in your blood anyhow. 20 years from now, what do you see, what do you see the industry being like and where, where do you see yourself? That's a good question. Things change. Um, you have to keep changing with the times. Uh, who knows what it's going to be 20 years from now. 20 years from now, we might have a device that makes, you know, listeners that are listening in their car able to communicate with you directly at the radio station. I don't know. Uh, but as long as there's going to be people complaining about politics, people complaining about sports, uh, people second-guessing the quarterback or the coach or, you know, complaining that this politician's full of blank, there's always going to be a place for news talk and sports radio. And that's kind of what my love is right now. Music genres come and go. Um, sometimes there'll be a Latin phase, sometimes there'll be a hip hop phase, you know, a young country phase, a classic country phase. Music tastes come and go, uh, but news and sports and politics, um, they stay. And that's kind of why I feel confident that WIBC, who is one of the oldest radio stations in the country, uh, they recently celebrated their 75th anniversary a couple years ago, longtime home of IU basketball, longtime home of the Indy 500, Indy's news leader. Uh, they're going to be around. They've been around a lot longer than I've been alive. They'll probably be around when I'm gone, uh, but I'm honored to be part of that staff. Uh, they've won national awards for broadcast excellence and the news coverage. And as a radio broadcast nerd, um, it's awesome to be part of that heritage of a station, to work a monument circle, to look out the window and see, you know, at Christmas time, the world's largest Christmas tree and just the city of Indianapolis as your backdrop. I love it. And so it sounds like you're here for a while. I hope so. And maybe now watch me get fired tomorrow. Yeah. This is all going to get completely jinxed. But I do enjoy it, and I love it. And 20 years from now, you'll be talking about the Ivanka Trump's presidency. Exactly. There exactly. you go. Exactly right. There's so much <laughs> irony in this world today. Um, again, Jason Hammer, now, I think you're probably going to want to listen to him 9 to 11 now, five days a week. Uh, very entertaining. Appreciate your time. Oh, thank you And on behalf much. of our Renaissance Committee, oh, wow. we want to thank you for allowing us to infringe on your time a little bit. This is probably your nap time, isn't it? <laughs> there's, there's no rest for the wicked. No rest no, for the wicked. You wind. should know this. And uh, I'm not going to be one of these people that receives an award and then, then goes on a long political rant like you would see at the Oscars or the Grammys uh, because I'm not a professional victim. But I will say thank you so much, and this is very awesome, and thank you so much. Again, we want to thank Jason Hammer from the class of 1996. Again, another alumni that uh, we probably have waited too long to get in here, <laughs> alumnus, I should say. Uh, very happy to have him. He will join uh, the other members of our Alumni Hall of Fame, and we will be back next month with another version of the Hornet Spotlight. Thank you for watching.